So I was a little bit taken by surprise. I didn't expect to speak this morning, but I'm happy I have the opportunity to, on this most auspicious day, auspicious in the sense that when the spiritual master appears, his work is not known in, in the world, but when he disappears, and we honor him for all the activities, all the contributions, all the things he leaves behind in our life that becomes the essence of our focus in life in order to reach the goal of life, which is Premupamartha Maha, love of God. Disappearance, Srila Prabhupada speaks about this himself, appearance and disappearance is just like the rising and the setting of the sun. The sun appears in our vision over the horizon at a certain time of the day and also departs our vision at a certain time. And the sun seems to appear and disappear, but there is no such thing as the sun appearing and disappearing. The sun is always in its orbit, somewhere in existence. But from our vision, it appears in that way. So similarly, the pure devotee spiritual master comes by the encouragement, the mission of the Lord to bring the message of the Lord, which is pure devotional service to the fallen conditioned souls in this world. And so when they appear, we don't really have that much understanding of the value of their presence. But when we, they disappear, then we feel great loss and great unhappiness. That unhappiness is our own unhappiness as was brought out by, I think it was Trinachi, that when the Lord goes back, or great souls go, when the great souls go back, it's no loss for them. They actually, again, associate with Krishna or go somewhere else to do the same thing in some other place within the creation. But for us, it's a great unhappiness because there's a sense of loss. But that sense of loss cannot, can actually be made up by understanding what is the mission of the spiritual master. Simply to teach us what he has come to give us. And what is that? A life of pure devotional service to Krishna, a chance to perfect our life and to go back home, back to Godhead. Every day we sing one prayer in glorification of the spiritual master. Chakshudan Diloye Janmi Janmi Prabhu Se Dibya Gyan Ride Prakasita. He opens my eyes with knowledge. We are sleeping, the conditioned soul is one who is sleeping in the idea that happiness can be found through the mind, through the senses, through material activities. This is called maya, or the illusionary energy, which creates this false sense of idea, which we, everyone in this material world pursues with great enthusiasm. So when this knowledge comes, it's like a light within this darkness of illusion to break us out of this foolishness and to help us understand where real happiness is and how to find that real happiness. And he teaches this knowledge by teaching us our identity. <laughs> this Dibhigyan, Srila Prabhupada speaks about this also. What is this Dibhigyan? This transcendental knowledge comes in various manifestations of its own essence. But the actual fundamental principle of this knowledge is that you're Krishna's eternal servant. That's all. <laughs> that is your identity. You have no other identity. Whatever other, other identity we accept, it's simply a temporary manifestation 
of coming into this material world and accepting a material body and acting in that way. It's like, it's like the seasons, they come and they go. So whatever identities we have, man, woman, black, white, this culture, that culture, this position, that position, there's so many varieties of manifestations of our temporary manifestations in this world, but they're all temporary and they're all part of the illusionary energy. So this divgyan, it's the greatest gift to the human society. Why? Because it solves all problems. Whatever problems we're having can be found in our in the execution of our loving relationship to Krishna. It is completely destroyed by that process. Mm -hmm. So therefore we are not only grateful, but as was mentioned by the previous speakers, eternally grateful. Srila Prabhupada mentions in one purport in Srimad Bhagavatam in the fourth canto, he explains that sometimes a disciple will think, I should do something to pay back the debt that my spiritual master has given me. And that is important, it's necessary, it's laudable, it should be done. But then he goes on to say that that debt can never be paid. <laughs> and one should try to, but at the same time one should know that one can never pay that debt. And the explanation is that one thinks that I can pay back that debt, he becomes compared to a person who is on stage making jokes. <laughs> In other words, a person who is just creating himself as a center of laughter. <laughs> so that, Prabhupada wanted to illustrate that this gift of eternal life coming by way of pure devotional service is not only rare, but it is what we are looking for. It is our, the essence of everything that we aspire for in life can be found in pure devotional service. I'd like to just mention one story that is one of my favorite little pastimes that was written by and spoken by Shruti Kirti Prabhu in one of his books, um, What's the Difficulty? He writes so beautiful, his own personal experiences with Srila Prabhupada. And he narrates so lovingly and so intimately his relationship with Srila Prabhupada that it just brings Prabhupada into our life in a very, very powerful way. But one of my favorite stories is, and it has a very po powerful message to it. And Sruti Kirti Prabhu used to travel with Prabhupada in many places around the world. And they would fly on airplanes together. And they were coming into one place, and the devotees had gathered into the airport to greet Srila Prabhupada. And it was a tumultuous welcoming. So many, many, many devotees had come, and there was a kirtan, and many new people had come who had never saw Prabhupada before and were so eager to meet the guru after hearing from the devotees. It was quite ecstatic and very emotional. When Prabhupada appeared, it explains by Shruti Kirti that the people were crying. Some were actually rolling on the ground. It was a combination of emotions from, from different angles. It was so, so joyous. And Shruti Kirti Prabhu was seeing this situation. And in his mind, he was thinking, wow, these devotees, these persons, have so much affection and attraction for Prabhupada. I don't have that. <laughs> But he didn't say something, he just said it and he kept it into his heart. So later on he went with Prabhupada to where Prabhupada was staying and he was doing his personal service, arranging his breakfast and giving him his massage. And while he was massaging Prabhupada, he had to ask that question. 
He said, Srila Prabhupada, when we came into the airport today, I saw the devotees, they had so much affection, so much love for you, so much feeling. I'm your, I'm always with you, and I don't have that feeling. He wanted some consolation to the feeling of his heart, how he didn't feel like that. And Prabhupada just said, Prabhupada didn't say anything. Prabhupada remained quiet. And then he finished his massage and Prabhupada took his bath and the lunch prasadam was prepared. And Prabhupada was more quiet than normal. Usually he would speak about different things. And Shruti Kirti Prabhu was thinking, maybe I shouldn't have asked that question. But finally, uh, Prabhupada took his lunch and then Shruti Kirti came in to take the, the plate away. And when he came in to offer his obeisances, Prabhupada said to him, Do you like your service? And Shruti Kirti Prabhu said, Oh, yes, Prabhupada, I like my service a lot. This, this, he, he expressed his, his gratitude and his appreciation for having this service. Prabhupada said, That is love. That is love. that not to minimize the expressions that we have towards Prabhupada in glorification, but without the service attitude, they remain external. They remain external. So the real expression of our appreciation for Prabhupada is to take his instructions to heart and make our life one of devotional service to, sh to the Supreme Personality of Godhead following Srila Prabhupada's instructions. Thank you very much. May I beg the mercy of His Holiness Radhanath Swami, my, my uh, God brothers and God sisters, and all the Vaishnav, to try to utter a few words of clarification for Srila Prabhupada on his glorious disappearance day. So, um, as Srila Bhaktivinod said, he is on seal who tells that Vaishnav dies when you are still living in sound. Vaishnav dies to live, and while living, try to spread the holy name around. So, Mar Maharaj has asked to talk about Russia. So I will, I will try to, to talk about the beginning uh, of the movement in Russia in glorification of Srila Prabhupada because it's by his vision and by his dream that everything came to be. So everything beca uh, began in Bury Place uh, in 71. At this time, uh, uh, Bury Place was the first temple in London, England, and our beloved Yamuna had been called to India by Srila Prabhupada. So she, she had trained me to, to become a pujari, and I was taking care of Shishivada Londonishwara, or I should say they were taking care of me. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so, uh, actually, uh, Sri Prabhupada loved all the deities very dearly. But uh, maybe uh, I can say he, had, he was very fond of Sri Sri Vadalandanishvara. He had actually kidnapped them in, in London. And uh, he said uh, regarding uh, these deities that Krishna has tricked you. He didn't come as a murti, but actually he came himself. Uh, so at this time, serving them uh, was really so extraordinary because I had been studying uh, in personalist philosophy and just by serving them day by day, they, uh, they clean a lot of impersonal, uh, impersonalism that, stayed, that remained in my heart. I read one time in uh, Srila Prabhupada's book, that if the spiritual master asks you to do a task a little difficult, 
And if you say yes immediately, then you will progress in spiritual life. So I went to, to my dear Shishiro Adalondanishwara, and very enthusiastically, I told them, I would love Srila Prabhupada to ask me to do something a little difficult, but please, please, help me to remember to say yes. <laughs> so so uh, then we heard that Srila Prabhupada had gone to Moscow. And uh, of course, at this time, it was very uh, strong communism. It was what we call the Iron Curtain. And <clears throat> uh, I remember hearing this news and thinking, Srila Prabhupada is so brave. Certainly a place I will never go. Uh, then, uh, after Moscow, he came back to Bury Place. And uh, I was doing some manual uh, service uh, to Srila Prabhupada, cleaning his clothes, uh, bringing his fruit offering. And uh, one day, somebody came and said, Srila Prabhupada wants to see you. Hurry up, Mandakini. So uh, I was terrified. I, I thought uh, I made a really a mistake. What did I do wrong? Uh, I opened the door after, after knocking. Uh, it was actually a very beautiful room. Uh, the, the floor was made of wood painted blue. And as, if I remember correctly, uh, the walls were peach color. Sher Prabhupada loved that color because when he was a child, uh, he had a room with these colors. He was there sitting with Shama Sundar Prabhu. And uh, when I came, he said, he had a big smile, and he said, oh, Mandakini. And uh, in, a, in, a very, in a very simple way, uh, in the same way, he would ask me to, to go and get some potatoes across the street. He said, Mandakini, would you like to go to Russia and to, and to marry uh, this uh, new boy, Anatoly? And by the grace of Krishna, to to help spreading the mission of Lord Chaitanya there. And I, I remembered my prayers. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, immediately I, I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> and then he, he had this big uh, oceanic smile. And uh, he said, OK, Shyamasunda. You take care of everything, you arrange everything. So they, then the saga started. And uh, it was such a, one of a, its many best times in Krishna consciousness. And, and as Maharaj mentioned in his lectures, we also have a lot of storms in our life. And uh, I'm getting old, 64 years, so it was sub sublime time, of spiritual sublime time. And, and terrible, uh, terrible times as well. But that was one wonderful time. Uh, then I started trying to learn Russian, and uh, I forgot everything about it. And, and, and uh, then I got ready to go to France to get the visa. But already it seemed that people, Russian people, knew about it. Our desire to spread Krishna consciousness there. Uh, a lot of people were coming to the temple, uh, speaking uh, with a Russian accent, and asking uh, very strange questions. We were supposed to tell no one about it. So I got my Russian visa. I remember it was a tourist visa. And uh, I was supposed to go every night to see the Bolshoi uh, dancer, uh, you know, the theater, the, the ballet. Uh, so I remember getting in the plane, and for the first time in, uh, um, in uh, one year and a half, I had to put civil clothes. It was feeling really, really funny. Uh, and uh, then we, I, I joined the tourist group, took the plane, and we landed in Moscow. And at this time, uh, maybe 43 years ago, Moscow looked very, very gray. There was no color, uh, hardly no cars. Very, uh, the architecture was like a Stalin style, and um, very, very impressive and sad and gray. So we came to the, to the hotel, 
And uh, I, uh, I was telling, uh, Shamasunda told me, don't take any beats, don't take any books. Just, uh, you know, be very discreet. So I tried to be really, really discreet, like a, like a tourist. And the, the leader of the group started to ask what everybody wanted to have for dinner. So she said, who wants some, uh, some meat? You know, uh, any kind of meat. I, I remember so people who were, were raising their, their hands. Yes, yes, I'll take that. Okay, so uh, then we have some fish. And uh, people say, yes, I will take some fish. Uh, and uh, not, uh, not many people were left. They, they took some eggs. And then I was the only one left. And, uh, and everybody looked at me and I thought, oh, I'm not discreet anymore. You know, I'm going to blow it up from the first day because we know the guide were reporting to the KGB any uh, strange behavior. So she looked at me and she says, what about you? And I had to say, well, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> and uh, so then I went up and uh, I thought, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to blow the whole thing. And coming, uh, coming on the stair where my room was, I saw um, a young boy who looked with a very serious look. And I, I thought maybe it's already KGB, you know, I didn't even start anything. And he says, are you, he said my name, Monique, you know. I said, yes, yes. He says, well, I am Anatoly. That was the, the Russian boy Srila Prabhupada had met. Uh, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you already heard the story from uh, Shyama Sunda Prabhu, that Srila Prabhupada actually went to, to meet Professor Katowski, who was heading the Asian department in the university, especially spe Sanskrit. But there was no real invitation. You know, they wrote each other, and Srila Prabhupada uh, said he would like to come, and Professor Katowski said it would be a good idea, but it was not really a formal invitation, but that was enough for Srila Prabhupada to get the visa. So Srila Prabhupada talked very nicely with Professor Katowski, uh, especially about Vanashram Dharma, how it's impossible to have a classless society, although communism said uh, it is classless, you know. But Prabhupada explained uh, how from birth people will have the propensity to, to, to study or to, to do uh, any kind of uh, manual work or to be a leader or a businessman. And uh, when uh, the discussion was finished, Srila Prabhupada said, can I meet the students? Uh, then uh, Professor Katowski said, oh, there is, the, no students are there today. Then he asked, can I meet the teachers? But actually nobody was in the university. Professor Katowski was so frightened that he had chosen a day where absolutely nobody would be in the university. So Sher Prabhupada was really uh, disappointed. And uh, he had to stay five days, and two days went by without Srila Prabhupada meeting anybody. But Shamasunda was feeling uh, really disturbed, and he prayed to Krishna that please, arrange something that Srila Prabhupada can be pleased and meet some youth. Uh, when the Shamasunda went to get some grocery, he was in a dhoti at Tilak, and one young boy approached him and asked him, are you from India? Then uh, Shamasunda became so joyful, and he told him, no, but my spiritual master is from India. Are you interested in the philosophy from India? And Anatoly said, yes, he, he, was, he was a very really bright young man. He, he was studying uh, theology and many other subjects in university. He says, yes, I would love to meet your spiritual master. So Sher Prabhupada brought him to, uh, sorry, Sherma Sundar brought him to meet Srila Prabhupada in his hotel room. 
And he, he said he never saw Srila Prabhupada giving so much to one person uh, at, like that, you know, giving so much power and shakti and knowledge. And so they talk about Vanashram Dharma, about preaching, about how to, to spread Krishna consciousness in Russia. And at the end, Anatoly said, actually, it would be good for me to, to have a, a foreign wife. It would be a kind of protection. So, so when Srila Prabhupada came back uh, to, to England, uh, I got really so much mercy to be a witness. Uh, I didn't do much at all, but I was a witness to that wonderful adventure. Uh, and also, uh, for Prabhupada, I come from France, so at that time, there was a very strong communist party in France. So, so Srila Prabhupada thought it would be good to, for, for the Russian authorities. He wanted me to, to get legally married, to get a permanent visa. But somehow or other, uh, I went there about for a little over six years, but I never, get, I never got a permanent visa, a residential visa. They were just give me, giving me some uh, tourist visa, maybe uh, the most one, 10, 15 days, and the shortest was four days because they absolutely didn't want Krishna consciousness to be spread in Russia. And it, as it became true, they thought Krishna consciousness is one of the biggest enemy of communism. Uh, Shyama Sundar actually uh, uh, is maybe already uh, completed, I don't know, but he wanted to write a, a book uh, called The Five Days That Changed the World. So maybe it's completed, uh, we have to find out. Uh, coming, uh, co coming the first time in Russia, uh, uh, the preaching was very simple. We used to visit Anatoly's friends, preaching mostly from Bhagavad Gita. He was translating to, to, his, um, to his friends. We cooked prashadam, uh, and we, we were having kirtan in, the, in, the, in his home. He was living with his mother. And uh, I remember I was a little, uh, now I can, I can see I was a fanatical Brahmacharini at the time. So in the kitchen, the mother was, was having fish. So I used to take the fish and put it in the garbage. But, but people were really poor in Russia at this time. So, so Anatoly, who became an Antashanti, used to pick it from the garbage, put it back in the fridge, and, 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 tell, and he was telling me, you shouldn't do that, you know. Uh, so that was really uh, so, so blissful time. Uh, you know, like, like going into such a place, uh, I was able to feel Srila Prabhupada's presence and Lord Krishna's presence so much. Uh, and I want to, to share with you uh, how, how the first uh, Srimad Bhagavatam came into Moscow, because it was actually completely Srila Prabhupada and Krishna's doing. Like, I felt so foolish I couldn't do anything, so they took over. So it was so wonderful to be a witness. Shyama Sundar got the first uh, volume of the Srimad Bhagavatam from the, hot from the press in America. And he told me, Mandakini, you should take them to Moscow. So I thought maybe taking the train will be easier. I won't be checked so much at the border. So I took the books. They were so beautiful, new. That was the blue cover with the planets, you know, Mahavishnu and the planets. And uh, it was two days uh, traveling, uh, sleepers in the train. And uh, one French lady came to me and uh, she, she told me, I hope you, you don't have any uh, religious books with you. Because they, they get, the militians, they get really mad about it. Uh, I said, no, no, it's all right. <laughs> And she said, yeah, you know, and you cannot hide them anywhere. 
So then I started uh, chanting and praying, and then I, I asked Srila Prabhupada and, uh, and Krishna, I don't know what to do. There is no place to hide these books. And it's certainly your desire that they come to, to Moscow. So please, you have to do something. Like uh, I'm completely useless and uh, I have no intelligence. So please, you have to do something. And um, one, day, one day later, uh, in the corridor of the train in the hall, uh, was a young Indian man with his wife. I thought, maybe it will be easier for him if he, if he takes the book, because it is his culture. And uh, I approached him, you know, and uh, we were having small talks. And he, he asked me, actually, what are you going to do in Moscow? Do you know anybody? I said, yes, uh, I have some, um, some uh, friends, some Russian friends. And uh, Anatoly had actually uh, a young Indian friend who was the son, I don't know if the son of um, a very uh, important officer, maybe the ambassador of India, or, you know, who was working in the consulate. And I, I say yes, and I have an Indian friend. He says, what is his name? Because the community is quite small. So I told the name, and he says, really? But that's the son of my boss. And uh, so uh, quickly in my mind, I understood that, that man was, was working in the consulate, Indian consulate. So I asked him, oh, actually, you know, I got some, um, some gift from the, um, the son of your, of your boss. But they, they are religious uh, book, the Bhagavad Purana, would you mind to put them in your diplomatic suitcase? And, uh, and, uh, and, and he says, oh, absolutely, I will, be, I will be really happy to do that. I'm going to stop in Poland, and, uh, but in a, in a few days, I'll give them to my boss. So uh, I was so joyful and... And uh, so honored and happy to, to be a witness of Krishna uh, taking over. And uh, you know, then uh, we came to the Russian border, and the milit militians looked very fierce. Uh, and they looked everywhere. There was no way of hiding anything. So I tried not to smile, to keep a straight face, you know. <laughs> but inside, I was laughing and laughing. And, uh, and, and, and I thought, oh, Krishna and Shri Prabhupada, they are much more intelligent than you. You, can, you cannot stop Krishna consciousness to go into Russia. And, uh, and I thought of that beautiful verse. Uh, I may not um, recite it correctly, but the meaning was, um, after Krishna's disappearance, uh, the, uh, the Bhagavad Purana, has appeared as his literary incarnation, and it will um, illuminate the darkness of Kali Yuga. And Moscow looked very, very, very dark. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a... <laughs> so, uh, that, was, that was something like that, and uh, also, uh, I can share, then we had, to, we, we had to get married. That was Prabhupada's wish. But um, the Kichibe tried to take the, the legal paper of Ananta Shanti. Uh, Prabhupada initiated him by letter, uh, not even by letter, because it was dangerous, but he told probably Hans Saduta, who went there at this time, that his name was Ananta Shanti. Uh, so we... He, he, he was quite bright, and he, he managed not to give the papers, and he found two people from the street to be witnesses. So we, we went to, to the mayor, uh, yeah, to the, how do you say in English, the, you know, the place you get married. And um, we got legally married really, really quickly, uh, and I became uh, Mrs. Pinayev then. <laughs> And as I told you, I was quite a fanatical uh, Brahmacharini. Uh, uh, I was still, I was thinking uh, I was broad-minded, but I told um, Ananta Shanti after, you know, Prabhuji, 
uh, actually, uh, sex life is only to, to have children. And to, to have children, we have to be pure devotees. <laughs> so he, he says, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, at this time, we didn't have, um, you know, uh, wonderful preachers who were telling us about married life. We didn't have... Um, the lectures, the lectures of Chaitanya Chandra, Prabhu, and so, and then he, he kind of accepted. And every time it was the same, very, very blissful to meet, to meet the devotees, to, to share Krishna consciousness in whatever way was possible. But uh, after, after six, a little over six years, Srila Prabhupada told me, if you, could, if you cannot get the residential visa, uh, maybe it's no use to go anymore. And uh, in a very selfish way, I have to, I have to admit, I was, I was attached to that service because it was constant uh, reporting and association with Srila Prabhupada. So I looked at him, it was in, in England, in Bhaktivedanta Manor, in his room, and I said, oh, sure, Prabhupada, can I try a little more? And he was so kind, you know, although he knew it was no use, he was so kind, he says, yes, try, try a little more, try a little more. <laughs> and I, I tried a little more, but at one point it, it became obvious that uh, I would never get the residential, uh, residential visa. So then I, I stopped, and, uh, and at this time, actually, that, uh, that devotee, Ananta Shanti, uh, really uh, started to preach in, in such an amazing way. Uh, you know, he, he became more and more empowered, and uh, the Russian devotees, they have heard that he, he was quite uh, eccentric. He, he was not like a... I would say a normal, uh, you know, very uh, uh, rules-obeying uh, devotee, but he had, he had a lot of shakti, a lot of determination, and a lot of faith uh, for, to, towards Srila Prabhupada and towards the mission. After, after some times, uh, the, the KGB became very worried of Krishna consciousness, and maybe some of the Russian devotees here have been to the 40th anniversary of Srila Prabhupada coming to Moscow. That was one of the greatest festivals uh, because we saw the, the veterans who actually went to, to camps and prisons. And one of them told us he was, he was at the time a KGB member. And uh, the, uh, his uh, officers told him here, I give you this book, Bhagavad Gita, as it is, by Swami Esi Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada. You have to study it very, very carefully because, because you have to know your enemy. So you should, you should really study it very, very, very carefully. So he did, but he, he loved it. <laughs> and, uh, he, <laughs> He loved it, and um, he, he had actually the list of the people he was supposed to arrest, and he, one day he went to one lady, he knocked on the door, she was very frightened, and he said, don't worry, don't worry, I just want you to, to give me a little more explanation about Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, um, then he went back to to his officers, and he said, uh, actually, I have to tell you the truth. I love my country. I love Marx. I love Lenin. I love communism. And I always did everything you told me. But you have told me to study that book. And I, honestly, I don't find anything wrong with it. Uh, I think it's really good. So do whatever you like with me but I just follow, followed your orders. Then uh, they, they reflected and they said, okay. They didn't punish him, but they took him off uh, the mission of arresting devotees. <laughs> then uh, just to, I don't want to take too much time, but just to honor the, the first 
Russian devotees, just a few stories to share. Um, Let's start with uh, Ananta Shanti Prabhu. Uh, you, maybe you know he departed a, a year, about a year ago. About a year ago. Uh, so uh, he was taken to the mental hospital because he was the leader. But what the leaders did at that time, they very quickly trained other devotees to become leaders. So it will always be somebody to preach. They knew they will be arrested. So uh, just before he was arrested, to share the way of preaching he was doing. At one time, there was no books. So he used to offer, uh, to, to take uh, some beautiful red roses and offer them with great devotion to Krishna and Prabhupada. Then he would go out he would dress up very nicely in a white suit or something. He was quite an attractive young boy. And he would give the red, uh, red roses prashadam to, to people in the street. And uh, when the police came, he used to say, they say, why, why are you doing that? He used to say, oh, I'm just in love. And I want to share this love with everyone in the street. <laughs> so... Uh, another way of preaching was to, uh, to sit at a table in a cafe and to, uh, to open the Srimad Bhagavatam with the beautiful paintings. Then people would be so curious. They would come and ask him, oh, what is this? What is this? You know? Then he could talk. And uh, another way of preaching that we won't recommend to the brahmacharis and sannyasis uh, he was going to, uh, how do you say in English, uh, you know, where people dance at night, young people, what's the name, uh, you know, like, uh? yeah, uh, he used to go to such places where young people were dancing and singing, always dressed up nicely, and then some, uh, some young girls would be kind of attracted or, you know, wanted to know more, so then, uh, uh, they would come out, uh, he will take her to a place and start preaching, you know, <laughs> like that. Uh, and after, also they, uh, him and other devotees made up um, a scientific society uh, that, was, that was actually to test the effects of the mantra on, uh, on the animals, plants and humans. And it was actually agreed by uh, the Soviet authorities. So they, they were doing that. They were giving reports what was the effect of the Mahamantra on the plants, on the, on the animals and the humans. So to, just to go a little quickly, uh, after when Ananta Shanti was taken to the prison camp, Okay. When he was taken to the prison camp, um, he, one time, it, it was very hard, it was before the hospital, uh, he was really tortured and taken to, taken to a dark cell, and at this time he told me over the phone, when I went back to Moscow, that he, he had a lot of fear actually, he didn't know if he, if he will be able to, to carry on, you know because they really wanted to break his will. And all of a sudden, it was like Krishna's doing and Srila Prabhupada's doing. The, the beautiful verse, verse in the Gita came, uh, the, the verse uh, which is speaking about the soul being immortal. The soul cannot be cut. The soul cannot be burnt into ashes. And then it was like... Um, he realized that then I'm free. I'm the soul, I'm free. So they, they cannot do anything about, about it. They, cannot, they can torture the body, but me, the soul, I'm free. And he became very joyful. Uh, one, one thing also about about uh, Ananta Shanti was that 
before he went to the mental hospital, uh, one, um, one devotee who was coming from the West told him, Srila Prabhupada is coming to Moscow. So he put, he put the date on a little agenda and Prabhupada didn't come because it was too dangerous. So uh, devotees told, told me that he always kept the page he was, he told, he told from the agenda near his heart that saying that Srila Prabhupada is coming on such and such day. And the last, the last uh, thing I like to share is from one other devotee who was also in, a, in prison. His name is Baladraj. Baladraj says he, he was also tortured by, by the KGB in the same, with the same purpose of breaking his will. And uh, then he came back, you know, after being beaten and everything, and he saw that in the cell, one more person was present, turning his back. There was, before he left, there was only one person in the cell. And now two persons were there. And uh, he was kind of half seeing because he had tears and blood and everything. And that person actually turned towards him and he saw Srila Prabhupada and Srila Prabhupada was crying. And Srila Prabhupada told him, actually, I never wanted that for you. I never wanted that for you. So just to say that, uh, that, that uh, this was just to glorify, you know, Srila Prabhupada's extraordinary work in, in Russia. And of course, this is only one country. Uh, but, you know, he, he was using the devotees as instruments, and these devotees were so at so much mercy to, to be there and to respond to Srila Prabhupada's call. So uh, I wanted to, to thank all of you and, uh, and to, you know, to say how grateful I am to be amongst all of you today. Uh, this is increasing. Um, my, my love in separation for Srila Prabhupada because I can see Srila Prabhupada through all my exalted God brothers and God sisters and through all his grandchildren here. And I remember uh, Srila Prabhupada used to tell us when he was on the planet, then on the appearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, this is the one day you can directly pray uh, to uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati because he loves his grandchildren very much. And he, he was laughing and he was saying, uh, actually, the grandfather is nicer than the father. He doesn't have to chastise like that. So thank you to, to all of you. And uh, I beg uh, for your mercy that until my last breath, I'll be able to, to be of a, of a little service to to Srila Prabhupada and to all of you. Hare Krishna. I'm very happy to be here with all the devotees celebrating the Tirubhav Mahotsav of Srila Prabhupada. And um, I uh, <clears throat> I was wondering what to speak because I've spoken so many years now in this same congregation. So the Mumbai devotees already know most of um, my personal experience with Sila Prabhupada. Um, so I'm trying to speak on something else, but at the same time, maybe here and there some, some things will slip in that the Bombay devotees have heard, but maybe the other devotees have not heard. So, I, um, uh, my um, service during Srila Prabhupada's uh, stay with us was mainly um, distributing Srila Prabhupada's books, uh, which he uh, very much wanted us to um, um, distribute as many as possible and since uh, in Los Angeles where I was the BBT was there 
uh, and the books were printed, Prabhupada kept on saying, um, you um, must, them all, must also distribute them and also read them. Uh, they should not just sit in the warehouse. And we had a huge warehouse with um, trucks and trucks loads, load of books. So I wanted to speak about Prabhupada inspiring us how to preach Krishna consciousness to others. He had sent, he has sent his early disciples out to um, venture out into other countries. And then as he would, has promised in many places that he would come when a group of um, people were all, uh, that were sincere were already gathered and then he would come and initiate us. So one time in um, 1971, in the Arda Kumbha Mela in, um, in uh, Allahabad, um, he was preaching to his own disciples. And uh, in the mornings, he would have the, a class in English. And in the evenings, he would have one class in Hindi for the general public. So um, the, it was very cold. The devotees were gathering around him in the January. Um, freezing weather there and the devotees were very much uh, performing the austerity just because they loved Srila Prabhupada so much and they wanted to hear him speak. So he spoke on the, um, on the um, uh, deliverance of Ajamil. So he uh, explained that uh, Ajamil um, was calling out Narayan's name in great anxiety and without offense. And because of that, he was cleared of all his uh, sinful activities. And he said, this is not an exaggeration. He, he said, it, he, he actually became a sadhu. And then he was pointing out that Prahlad Maharaj was also a sadhu, that um, Dhruva Maharaj was a sadhu, Ambarish Maharaj was a sadhu. And great rajas of the past, great, great kings of the past, were like rishis also, and they were called Raj rishis. And um, then uh, he was saying that such sadhus, they speak only on the authority of the, uh, of the Vedic literatures. They um, do not um, uh, concoct their own ideas. And they're always engaged in the service of a lord. Uh, not that he sits alone in a place and enjoys the fruit of his spiritual advancement uh, and does only his um, own bhajan for his own benefit. Actually, he explained that uh, in his Vrindavan bhajans in very great detail, that, um, um, that the sadhu is, uh, a, a, a sadhu is trying to also make other people a sadhu. He's not only interested to perfect his own life, but he wants to help others to become perfect also in their lives. So, um, so he's, he explained, we are not coming to Kumbha Mela uh, just to uh, take a, a snan for our own um, advancement or to leave our sins behind. Uh, and to, to aspire for liberation. This is not why we are coming here. We are coming here to reclaim the fallen conditioned souls to preach Krishna consciousness. And um, so many reasons for, for, in so many ways, Srila Prabhupada made all these decisions on this grounds. If we would go uh, preach, we would go into the center of the city and not on, in some remote place out in the country, which is nice. Of course, nowadays we're doing that in addition, but the reach out centers, Prabhupada and Sila Bhakti Siddhanta also like to be always in the center of town. So he always uh, asked us when we, um, when we start temples, we should look out for that. So, so this was in, um, 71, January 71, but a few months before that, um, 
he had uh, inspired some devotees to go and preach in Japan. Uh, and one of them was Bali Madan, and uh, later on also um, Burjan was also there. And um, um, names. Um, Sudama Maharaj was there. He was not a Maharaj then, he was still a Grasta then. And um, so uh, then later on, Bali Madan was uh, sent to Australia. He wanted to go to Australia to preach there. And that is where I got to know him. And um, then again, uh, he was very, uh, he was very, uh, a very good preacher and he was, um, he knew also how to present Krishna consciousness to others. And then there was also Bali Madan and um, um, later. Uh, so they, two of them preached in um, Australia. And then uh, Bali Madan was uh, actually asked by Silo Prabhupada to, um, to, uh, to become the GBC for the for Australasia, for all the Asian countries also, and to start some centers there. So there's one, um, so, so uh, he suggested then maybe we should go to Hong Kong and to, to uh, Singapore and try there to preach Krishna consciousness. So whenever Prabhupada saw that there was a spark of enthusiasm amongst his disciples, he immediately zoomed in on that and encouraged him further. So uh, Sila Prabhupada wrote to him, my dear Bali Madan, please accept my blessings. It's for your daring and active nature that I have chosen you to represent me as GBC man for the Southeast Asian zone. And I can see from your latest words that my choice had not been wrong. I think that Hong Kong and Singapore are English speaking places, so you will not find much difficulties. So just open two nice centers there immediately. The basic principle is that everyone is meant to please Krishna. If we ourselves act in this consciousness, people will become attracted to devotional service. And then he said, please report uh, fortnightly to the other GBC men and to myself and always display my book whenever possible. He liked the books to be seen. And, uh, and sold, of course. And here in this yatta also, that is always part of it, that the books of Sri Prabhupada are there. So um, then, uh, uh, so he always gave um, some, uh, sometimes just an, a sentence of inspiration that the devotees could meditate on while they were preaching. So he is saying the basic principle is that everyone is meant to please Krishna. And if we act ourselves in Krishna conscious, people will bet become attracted to devotional service. Um, I remember in Los Angeles also that um, Srila Prabhupada came and in his opening, I mean in his um, arrival address, he was uh, speaking, at that time I was doing Sankirtan already in Los Angeles, and he was speaking um, on how it is natural and I remember what an impact it had on me and how much that helped me to meditate as I was going from one person to another to distribute the books. He was saying, um, he was quoting a verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrita which um, was not even printed at that time and that was in 75. Uh, he said, uh, Krishna Pema, no, uh, Nitya Sita Krishna Pema Sadhya, sadhya Kabunai uh, Shavanadi, uh, Shavanadi Shuddha Chitta uh, Karana, Karaya Odai. Uh, so this uh, Nitya Siddha, this perfection, uh, this is, is an eternal principle, the, uh, the perfection of love of God, to have love of God is naturally in everyone. Sadhya Kabuna, it's not acquired. It is not by some, uh, some process, it's not acquired. It is already there and by the nine processes of devotional service, it is awakened again. So uh, that had a big impression on me because the people were always saying, you know, why don't you take your 
why don't you practice this in India? Why don't you go back to India instead of bringing it here to us, you know? So sometimes it would become a little shaky, you know, thinking, yeah, are we just forcing this on people or is this, you know, what is this? You know, and Prabhupada said, no, this, you, you are American, you also have taken it, taken it up uh, yourself because it's already there in the heart. So go from one person to another and offer. And here he is saying, the basic principle is that everyone is meant to please Krishna. So he would always give us snippets of Krishna consciousness that we can easily remember even while we were distributing. Then, uh, uh, so, uh, so then uh, he arranged for Burijan to go with Bali Madan to Hong Kong and uh, to set up a preaching center there. Uh, both had been preaching in Japan already together, so they knew each other and they were working nicely together. Um, and sometime later also he sent Jagaterini uh, from Los Angeles to Hong Kong. He asked her, would you like to get married to Borijan Prabhu and help, her preaching, help him preaching in Hong Kong? So she agreed and later on was sent also. And uh, then Bali Madan left for Singapore. And he had also made arrangement for some other devotee, Amoga, from Los Angeles uh, to help him preach in Singapore. So both of them were contacting the Indian communities. That was like um, one of the hints Prabhupada gave them how they could start preaching. Um, so he said, my dear Bali Maharaj, he once again wrote a letter, my dear Bali Maharaj, please <clears throat> accept my blessings. You have, not, uh, you have mentioned going next to Singapore from Hong Kong. Singapore also is a nice place for organizing a center. There are many Indians who will support the movement. Originally, they all had, had the Indian culture, but I do not think you should spend your time at this stage in trying to learn so many local languages. Our most successful program is to begin preaching with the help of local interpreters. And he said, then you can train up some young intelligent men who already speak English there. And uh, when they are become familiar with the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, they can um, themselves preach to their own local people like that. And then he said again something, something that we could remember in our preaching. He said, the Hare Krishna mantra is an international mantra. I really like this, um, how Prabhupada was always very sharp to pick up which um, words are very popular and would make this um, um, understandable to the people. You know, he used international or scientific or universal, all these words that were used some by the hippies and some by, by professional people, scientific, etc., and um, to make them understand that this is something also for them. So uh, the Hare Krishna mantra is an international mantra. Simply try to induce the people to chant and they will understand everything. He had so much faith in the holy name that he knew that uh, Krishna in the form of the holy name would inspire them in their, heart, in their hearts to also take up this process. You all actually, you all actually authorized agents of my Guru Maharaj and through him, Lord Chaitanya, certainly he will give you and through him also you're the representatives of Lord Chaitanya and then Lord Chaitanya will give his blessings and, and will give you all strength to preach. Then he said, then he, then he explained also some things to help the devotees not to be caught up. He said regarding staying in various temples of demigods, because contacting the Indian community often meant to contact people who were worshiping the demigods. So he was saying, uh, you can stay at these temples, but you should not accept the pasadam of the demigods. He said in this, in this regards, we will take up the process like they do in Jagannath Puri. In Jagannath Puri, the, the main boga is offered to the uh, deity of Jagannath, and then it is uh, given to various temples around the, uh, um, of demigods around the, uh, around the main mandir of Jagannath. 
and they are offered to their deities, and then it is also distributed to every, can be distributed to everyone. He said, if it is done that way, that you offer first to the Lord, then to the demigods, then you can also eat that prasadam. But the devotees found it often quite difficult. You know, they were invited, and then how would we know who it was offered to, and this, you know, so many things, but they learned their ways. But at least they knew what Prabhupada's principle was. Then, uh, so then uh, Bali Madan had asked Amoga to come to Singapore and um, I was thinking, you know, when I heard how he was traveling, he was traveling on a boat, we had very little money and to go to the place where you wanted to preach, they also had to raise their own funds, you know. So he had very little money, so he took a boat, he went to Japan and from there he took a boat um, and he was sitting on the floor of the boat with many oriental passengers in a big group. He had a box of pasadam, of dry, dry pasadam, and um, he, was, he was feeling uh, secure that way. And um, he, uh, I was just thinking, you know, actually, Krishna arranged, arranged things in a, uh, in a very uh, wonderful way that many hippies who were already used to like, sitting on the floor and um, traveling in odd ways like hitchhiking and, and sitting on the floor of a boat to, to travel with many people to the Orient. So then uh, uh, Amoga joined uh, Bali Madan in um, Singapore and then the preaching started. Singapore, that was, as I said, a few months before 1971 when Srila Prabhupada was in Kumbha Mela, so a few months before that. No, sorry. Yeah, uh, Bali Madan preached in Japan and Australia before that and then uh, suggested that he wanted to go to Singapore. And uh, then um, Srila Prabhupada, um, this enthusiastic report of uh, um, them preaching in Singapore was reaching Srila Prabhupada. So then he, um, what I want to, meant to say is that, um, uh, that um, I lost the thread a little bit. Um, uh, in uh, yeah, so Singapore was is, was at that in '65. It was. Uh, I'll, I'll make it short. I'll make it short. It's almost finished. Uh, in '65, um, Singapore was separated from Malaysia, and so they were just in Singapore first. So then Prabhupada uh, got the message that they were going to, um, uh, that they were preaching and they needed some help. So while he was in Arda Kumar Mela in, in January 71 there, he was uh, immediately trying to gather some devotees that could help with that preaching also. So he spoke on this uh, Ajamil story and how this, the sadhu is trying to recruit others to, uh, to become sadhus also. And so, th so then right after that, he was, after one of these lectures, he said, so who will go to, uh, so who will go to uh, Singapore to help Bali Madan Maharaj? Uh, no, he was not Maharaj then, Bali Madan. And the devotees were shocked, they did not know, they didn't want to leave Srila Prabhupada but then, thinking for a few minutes, immediately one devotee, Gopal, he raised his hands, and then another one, Amoga, probably a French-Canadian devotee, and one American, one French-Canadian devotee, they volunteered, and, and they went to Singapore also. So this is like, um, and they got the help of, that's what I wanted to mention also, they, wanted, they got the help at first from one Chinese lady, very friendly Chinese lady who let them use their house, and from there, they had the freedom then to go out and preach and contact the community and have evening programs, etc. So I was thinking, then there was one friendly Chinese devotee who had given a little help 
but now how many, friend, uh, how many Chinese devotees, friendly Chinese ladies are there now to help and who, not, who are not just helping but who have given their lives to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And I see that it, it is all the potency of Srila Prabhupada, his faith in the holy name and his uh, inspiration that he gave to, the, to his disciples and to his grand disciples to preach Krishna consciousness. So um, we can all take our inspiration from Srila Prabhupada to go on preach Krishna consciousness and to make some personal sacrifices for that. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Nataki Mataji. ask for the blessings of all of my senior god brothers and god sisters and the blessings of all of the elders and I would like to beg that you all forgive me for any offense that I may have committed during my stay here I would like to thank all of you for your costless service to all the Vaishnavas and I would like to thank you for allowing all of us to come together and try to learn how to work together. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhaktivedanta Swamin Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Goavani Pachani Nevishe Shanyavari Paska Chadisha Tarani Vanchikapa Trubya Shara Kripa Sindubya Eva Cha Patita Nam Pavanebio Vaishnavi Namana Maha I would like to thank His Holiness Radhanath Swami for without His kind mercy and grace upon me I could not be here for many reasons. There was a time in my life when there was so much turmoil and it was a point where I knew that materially and spiritually I felt like I was going to die. And uh, I approached His Holiness Radhanath Swami through letter when he first started preaching in Mumbai in 1986. And I expressed my, my feelings within my heart and revealed all of the offenses that I had committed over the years to the devotees. Because at that time, not consciously, but I did not understand the principle of the association of the devotees and the Vaishnavas. I didn't understand how important that was. And Radhanath Swami Maharaj, he wrote me a letter and he said many things, but one of the things that I consciously remember throughout the years is that he said and instructed me to always keep my eyes fixed on the shade of the dust of the lotus feet of the Vaishnavas and to always, always, always take shelter of the holy name. And so I tried to remember that. And Maharaj, I thank you for that. It has helped me over the years tremendously. The first time that I was able to have contact with His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada was through a devotee. His name was Talavandas. He gave me a Krishna book. And when I opened the book, I saw the beautiful face of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. And I was so attracted just to see His face, and I felt in my heart that I had fell in love for the first time in my life. 
I won't go into all the details, but then later, uh, I was able, by the same devotee, to come to uh, New Govardhan Hill, which was the temple in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm from originally. And uh, I was able to come for the first time on Govardhan Puja. And, you know, after coming to the temple and my attraction was, I wasn't able to really see the deities, but my attraction was how the devotees were so enthusiastically engaged in service. They were just very happy and they were serving everyone so nicely. And that was very attractive to me because I had not had that experience of anyone who was doing any kind of, I didn't know the word service, but I was thinking they're working and they're very happy working and serving others. So that was very attractive to me. So after some time, in 1976, I was able to see Srila Prabhupada for the first time in my life. And in 1975, I had offered a prayer every day for one year if I could please be able to see Srila Prabhupada. And so his last visit to New Vrindavan in 1976, I was able to go there. And um, I just really couldn't believe that I was allowed an opportunity to see Srila Prabhupada. It was the best day of my life. And moving forward to the disappearance of Srila Prabhupada in 1977, it was a very special day. And uh, at that time I was cleaning the temple. And because I was in charge of cleaning, uh, the devotees, we had just finished Mangal Artik, the morning program, and we had just finished taking breakfast prasad. And so some of the devotees, some of the brahmacharis, had gone out on Sankirtan and some of the household uh, members had gone out on Sankirtan book distribution. And uh, we received a package. And it was a big box like this. And it came in the mail. And uh, when I went down to open the door, the mailman said, we have this box. But I couldn't carry it, so I had to go get the devotees to come and bring the box upstairs. And so we brought the box upstairs and we opened the box and we started pulling out all the styrofoam peanuts. And at that time, we never knew that there were any mortis of Srila Prabhupada. We never knew that. But when we started taking out all the styrofoam, there was a beautiful morti of Srila Prabhupada. And the devotees were just so excited. We started, Haribo, Jai Prabhupada. So we were so happy, we took him out and we put him on the desk of the temple president, whose name was Arjit at that time. And he was sitting on the desk and I had just had the opportunity to recover Srila Prabhupada's Vyasasan. And maybe five minutes after we placed him on the desk, the phone rang and it was Nuvrindavan and they said, Srila Prabhupada has just left. Now all of the excitement of the devotees turned to just everybody started crying. We didn't know what to do. And the temple president said, now we have to prepare for a festival. I can't even imagine a festival with so much pain and emotion of feelings of separation that now Srila Prabhupada has departed. It was the most difficult day ever in my life. So now we had to take Srila Prabhupada down and we had to dress him and we had to prepare a feast. We had to go and find all the devotees who had gone out on Sankirtan to inform them what had just taken place. And some devotees couldn't even come to the temple right away. And Mother Bhumata, who is my god sister, she passed away to join Srila Prabhupada this February, this year. She was wailing and wailing and Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, why did you leave us, you know? 
devotees were crying, you know, and it's so hard to try to have a celebration when there's so much pain. So even though it's a glorious day, it's still, for some of us, it's a very painful time in our lives and, and not because he's going to do more service for Sri Krishna in another place, but because we, the feelings of separation is so intense sometimes that it's just unbearable for us. And even to this day, some disciples cannot come to the temple on this day, you know, it's very difficult for them to face this day, you know. So, you know, I beg all of you to try to bond with each other, with heart connections, and to try to, as Srila Prabhupada said uh, during his final days, you will show your love for me by how well you cooperate with each other. And it doesn't mean that you, everybody's doing the same thing. You know, you may be doing different things, but still we have to learn how to cooperate. And I thank all of you because one day I really want to learn the principle of servant of the servant of the servant. And you're all teaching me this every day. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada.